I would say the first year after my diagnosis was really difficult um, because I had to, I didn't sustain remissions and I was, I understood that that was not most people. Um, and I was worried, you know, will I find something that's going to work? him and he said we have we have a clinical trial for you that you're eligible for and it's it's called um telquetamab telquetamab and he discussed it with me explained what the bispecifics were um and then i ended up getting onto that trial at mount sinai I trusted my doctors. I think that they thought the clinical trial was the best route. So I have to say, I did put trust in them. I can't say there was one thing that they said that made that decision for me, um, other than feeling like they all felt it was the best thing for me to get on to a clinical trial. I didn't know a lot about it. I didn't understand what immunotherapy was or bispecifics, but um, later it was explained to me so what I'm hearing is you had multiple experts you were consulting with and you really deferred to them. You said, hey, you're the ones who specialize in this. Whatever route you think is best for me, I, I put my faith in you. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't discuss it with, well, my husband and I talked about it, but not with the rest of my family. Um, I um, I didn't know anything about bispecific antibodies um, much until it was explained to me. When you hear clinical trials, most people don't oh. really hear about clinical trials. And then, so just the thought, the, the question is, you know, what did you know yeah. of clinical trials? Had you ever thought you would actually be on one? Did you have any anxieties about them? Yeah. I figured one, you know, 10, five years from now, maybe I'd need one, right? I didn't realize my disease would be that aggressive and moving so quickly. Um, I did have an idea about clinical trials from some of uh, some myeloma support people I had spoken to other patients that my coach had put me in touch with who had the same cytogenetics as me. I wanted to reach out to people that maybe had a similar myeloma to me. And I did speak to a couple that had been on clinical trials and have had myeloma for like 20 years. And some of them were on the Revlimid trial. And they talked to me about how what that felt like. So I felt very comfortable participating in that way, um, that it could help other people and hopefully help me. So. Yeah. J Julie, let me ask you, what was it in those conversations that was the most comforting for you to hear? That they, it worked. <laughs> so that it worked and that they, like you said, 20 year myeloma patients, survivors, um, were there any other questions you needed to have answered before you decided, yes, I will go on this clinical trial or was it Time is of the essence, and I just really want to give it a shot now. Well, you go through a screening process. So in that screening process, they let you know about all of the side effects. You meet with the research nurses and the doctor. Um, so I was well aware of what those what those would be. Um, they maybe don't know all of the side effects, but many they know. Can you describe those conversations ahead of the talquetamab clinical trial? Well, the, the screening was a couple of hours. They go through a lot of specifics with you about the trial and what's involved. Um, a lot of information. And then at the end, you sign a 35-page consent form. Um, so um, they told me that one of, some of the side effects with telketamab would be um, related to the skin and the hair and the sense of taste. So I experienced all of those side effects. Um, they had many, many patients on that trial at Mount Sinai. So I have, when I was on that trial, I had loss of taste, 
um, dry mouth. I, my fingernails split and fell off. Um, I lost my layer of skin on my hands and feet came off. You know, it was a, it was a difficult for me, a difficult, um, dealing with those side effects, but I knew what the risks were. I knew it was champ, you know, I, I, I possibly could get that. Were, were there any things that helped with any of those side effects, the dry mouth, the loss of yeah. taste, the skin peeling? The nurses were very good about um, giving me some over-the-counter things that worked. There was a patient who was also on the Telketamab study, a, a woman who about my age, who we bonded. Um, she was willing to talk to other patients. She told me about creams and lotions and things that she used that helped. So there was kind of a support there. And the research nurses are all fabulous about giving you that information. Okay. So the nurses helped you there with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And so you, um, how, how was, what did life look like? You had to go in, what was the procedure? Like people aren't familiar with bispecifics, right? So yeah. Yeah. Um, so the talcatamab was twice a month and there would be a pre-treatment of Benadryl and Tylenol. And then I would get the, the IV of the medicine um, that would last a few hours. And then afterwards you stay, they observe you. Yeah, I, it was a full day um, because when you start the day, first they take your labs and you have to wait an hour for the results. And if your blood counts are good, they proceed. Um, and then the pre-meds is an hour before you get the infusion. So you're waiting for that. So basically I looked at a time to just hang out and watch the latest movies on Netflix, you know? So it was kind of a relaxing day, you know? And at what point would you start to feel the side effects? I would say after a couple, it seemed pretty quick, pretty quick. Um, within the month, I was experiencing, I remember my hands, the first thing I noticed was my hands got very opaque and then the skin started peeling. Um, the dry mouth I think came later and the loss of taste a little bit later, um, but they came pretty quick. And the nails, um, there was a little bit of a delay in the nails. It was gradual that they got worse. That was, uh, I started at the end of August um, the testing. And then I, I was admitted, you have to go into the hospital for the first couple of weeks for a step up dose. So that was in September. Um, I was on it for two cycles, I believe. And then my disease started progressing again. And this was a familiar pattern for you. You were, there was a response. And then after a couple cycles or treatments, the numbers would start to go up again. And just to be clear, when you said you had to be in the hospital in the beginning for the talquetamab, was that the entire time? Or do you mean you had to be in the hospital for a week and a half yes, straight? Yes, for this particular trial, it was, um, you stay the whole time and they step up the dosage. Um, and they would do that, you're admitted to the hospital because one of the side effects is the cytochondrally syndrome, which, happens with these bispecific antibodies. So your body has to adjust to the, to the drug and they have to um, treat you for the, um, the CRS in the hospital. Right, did you experience CRS when you were? Yes, um, I had one, I wasn't horrible. Um, it happened uh, the day after and it just, it was a fever and um, feeling like I had some sort of virus. And then they came in and they gave me um, TOSI. TOSI is short for tocilizumab. Uh -huh. um, and I had the, immediately the fever went away. It was a miracle drug. And um, I, one thing I didn't mention is part during my diet, when I was diagnosed in October, they found a couple of plasma cytomas from um, the MRI I had. I had a plasma cytoma in my pancreas as well as in my manubrium. Um, at the time, they weren't sure it was a plasma cytoma. They, were gonna, they weren't gonna do a biopsy that was um, too inv invasive, 
But what happened was when I, after my induction therapy, it's, they shrunk. So they, they, at that, that point, they realized they were plasma cytomas, most likely from the myeloma. And when I was inpatient for the talketamab, one of the side effects was I was having a very intense pain in my abdomen. And the doctor explained that the medicine was targeting the pancreas because that was where I had this plasma cytoma, which I thought was fascinating. Okay. Thank you for letting us know that. I mean, that's, that's another part of it, right? And that's another thing you were dealing with. Um, so the numbers are going up again, bring us, bring us to where you were, Julie, in that moment again. I mean, you're already on a clinical trial. Um, there's a lot of hope there. What are the conversations like at that point? Well, as soon as I started seeing the numbers going up a little bit, I was alarmed and I didn't, I wasn't even waiting until they got to the level they said that it's progression of disease, which I forget, maybe 100 or 150 for the lambda free light chain, but it was close to that. And I had talked to my doctor. Um, he recommended another trial, another bispecific called Savostimab. And at that point, I again got another opinion from another doctor and was actually considering going on a different bispecific antibody trial. Um, the bispecific antibodies have different, each medication has a different target. So there's BCMA, which probably many patients have heard about with CAR T's. So that's one target. The talketamab is a different target and the savostamab is yet a different target. So I was contemplating, should I go on a BCMA bispecific also? Is that something I should consider? But my doctor at Mount Sinai said, look, there's only five slots, all of them. There's one slot that opened up with supposed to be up here at Mount Sinai, and you could have this slot. He thinks I should take it. <laughs> so I took it. I was so uncertain at that point what would work. Um, I went on the, so I went on the supposed to map trial. You had to go through all the paperwork again, the screening. The screening. Um, I don't think I had to do all of the pretests because some of them were still good from the last study. They had me. Do, they had required a brain MRI, so I had that. Um, but mostly, I still, I probably need another bone marrow. I'm guessing. But at this point, you've been through several different, you know, tri you know, regimens and getting into that first clinical trial. I imagine it was very hopeful. Where were you now? Were you still just as motivated or were you feeling a little bit demoralized? Where were you? I, I don't remember feeling that way. I, I was being positive about it. I said, and I was anxious to see if I, were, if I was going to respond to this medicine. That was the only thing I was focused on. Am I going to respond? Um, so I was very anxious to see if it was going to work. So you were, okay. So you were anxious, excited just to start. Let's see, let's see what the impact is. So you go through the screening, you, it's the same, it's the same hospital, it's the same hospital or the place to go to. Yeah. Right. And so you're familiar with it. So it's the Savostamab. Can you talk to us about what happened with that? Sure. Um, I was inpatient, but it was a different protocol from the Talketamab. I was inpatient. It was in December of uh, 2021. And um, you're inpatient three weeks in a row, but each time for four days. So you're inpatient four days and then you're discharged. So they do step up doses each of those three weeks, but you're not there the entire time. And again, I had the um, CRS. So um, they treated that, it was fine. Um, and then I went home and I was on. Um, the schedule, there's this particular trial has an endpoint after 17 cycles. So each cycle is 21 days. And I was able to have three weeks in between treatments, which was wonderful. It was just great. Um, the first time I had any, that kind of time span between treatments. So we were able to go to Florida back and forth a little bit during that time in between treatments and, and enjoy life a little bit. So that was great. 
being let out, being able to live my life. It was a wonderful feeling. Yeah. So after 17 cycles, which actually equates to a year, you're, you're done with the treatment. So that's the protocol of this particular trial. And it was, it was actually a pleasure. <laughs> it was a pleasure just, just having to um, not be at the hospital every week or every other week and going once every three weeks. I knew that was my full day there. I would, you know, you become friendly with the research nurses and all of the people there. And it was my routine. And, but I was able to live my life in between that. And I also didn't experience the kind of side effects I had with talcatamab. The sevostimab, I didn't have any side effects that I felt badly. I felt fine. Um, the only thing that they really were watched, well, they, they always watch everything, but the, my neutrophil count would come down and I had some neutropenia and I would have to have the Zarazio periodically throughout the treatment, but I didn't feel badly. I didn't, wasn't tired. I didn't realize it, but they were keeping on top of that. One of the cycles, they actually withheld the treatment because of my, my white blood count, my neutrophils were low. But that was it. Um, other than that, I felt fine through this process. And I was very grateful um, because I responded immediately to this drug. Well, one thing I felt quite good about is the doctors have said, said to me that this, these drugs, these bispecifics act differently than other drugs. People are sustaining their remissions. They're, there's a, they're long, durable responses. And I felt that gave me some hope. So uh, I actually connected with a woman who was on the Sevostimab trial, one of the very early, early trials. She was off of the drug already, maybe a year and a half, and she was still in remission. Uh, so I was hopeful about that. What is the meaning and the value of hearing from another person, a patient, a survivor, someone who's gone through what you're about to go through? Or you know, what is that? How meaningful is hearing from someone like that? It was wonderful. Um, I actually found this woman um, from an article she wrote, one of the um, myeloma support websites. And I they were able to give me her contact information. I saw this article she wrote about being on the supposed to map study. And we had a phone conversation. Um, it was just reassuring. Um, it'd be nice if there was some kind of community where people could reach out to each other on these trials, but I know there's a lot of confidentiality there. So it is it is something that I hear has given you a lot of hope throughout um as you're trying to figure it out. And I'm so glad. I mean, so how far out are you now? Um, and tell us how you're feeling, how you are. So my final treatment with Sevostimab was December 1st of 2022, and I'm in stringent complete response, MRD negative, which I've been in since early spring. So I'm, knock on wood, really hopeful and grateful, and I'm able to um, be in Florida and I have to just submit my labs once a month to Mount Sinai and once every three months go back for an in-person visit and get a PET CD. So um, I'm very grateful right now. And I always say knock on wood. So, so Julie, the, the follow-up, so it's monthly labs to be sent in, quarterly PET CT scans that yes. have to be done. How do you manage that? Um, I know people call it scansiety for some people. Maybe you, maybe you don't feel that, but how do you approach it now that you are able to live your life? And it's such a wonderful situation, especially compared to what you had experienced before, but you're still having to, to do these scans. Well, I'm happy. Um, I want them to be on top of it. Um, I did ask my doctor recently, do how will I have to get the um, PET scans every three months indefinitely? <laughs> And I believe that, you know, his answer was pretty much, um, he wants to keep going. I have extra medullary disease and they want to make sure, you know, nothing is happening in that end. Um, 
that would show the progression of disease. So I hope to get to a point where, um, you know, I, I don't need to go every three months for that, but I understand that. I accept the fact that it's a chronic illness. Um, I realize on an intellectual level that they could, there could be remission. There could be um, periods where I fall out of remission. I have relapses. I guess for me right now, emotionally, it's hard for my brain to go there. And I don't want to think about that. Um, I feel good now. And I guess when that happens, uh, if it happens, I'll deal with it. Um, I, I've accepted that, I think, um, intellectually. Um, hopefully, emotionally, I'll be okay with that as well. And... So if you were to humanize what clinical trials are in general and then what they've meant to you, that would be wonderful. Well, the clinical trial, I, I am such a proponent, obviously, of that right now. Um, I think that people that have an aggressive disease like me, and they're not able to sustain the remissions, if, I think it's a wonderful option. And I trusted my doctors that these were the best decisions for me. Um, some trials are newer than others, so they have less data. <clears throat> the Sevostimab, they did not have as much data. I would ask questions about certain side effects and they just don't know everything yet. Um, this, the Sevostimab, uh, I was told, will be hopefully FDA approved in 2025. So there's still a way to, way to go. Um, one of the bispecifics is already um, FDA approved. <clears throat> so I, I think there's so many options for patients. Early on in my diagnosis, I just didn't re really know if anything was gonna work. Um, I was worried that there's nothing that would work for me. And I am so grateful that I was on, I was on the trials that I was, and I, you know, unfortunately one didn't work, but I'm happy that I participated. And you also get a lot more attention when you're on a clinical trial at Mount Sinai. Um, you get your own private room for the IV. <laughs> um, but really, I think it's always an important conversation to have with your doctor and the clinical trials could mean the difference in your disease and getting better. And so, that, yeah, that was so, so powerful, Julie. Any, any last thing you want to say? Well, I think it's so important to take charge and, and really have control where you can control. You can't control this disease, but you can control how you respond and you could become knowledgeable and make decisions. So take control how you can take control of this disease, and that's through how you respond. And seek out all the information through all of the wonderful resources, the, you know, the nonprofits that we have for myeloma. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people there that, that want to help. So I'm grateful to that.